Living in an urban environment and trying to grow food can require you to be very resourceful and creative in finding a way to work around the steel and concrete. Some interesting ideas can be in traffic circles, in balconies, the tops of roofs, and anywhere you can find a place to lay down soil. One company that is particularly adept at rooftop gardening is Figaro's Garden. A neighborhood garden service store in East Vancouver, they have many years of experience in designing, installing, and maintaining gardens that are a bit closer to the sky. Uh, so my name is Connor. I'm one of the managers here at Figaro's Garden. Uh, Figaro's Garden's been at Eastside Garden Center for the last 30 years or so. It started up in the early 90s. It's changed hands a few times in that time. Um, Hartley Rosen, the current owner, has been here for the past almost 10 years now. Uh, we're a neighborhood garden center. Uh, the shop is a former uh, greengrocer turned corner store. Uh, and so one of our biggest challenges is space because we really just have the footprint of the shop here. Uh, we have this outdoor space, a rooftop garden. We try to make the most of our, our room here. So we use it for growing some cut flowers. We'll put any plants that need a little extra attention up here. Uh, we also do some small scale production up here as well. We only have this you know, small square footage, so we have to just make the most of it. So things to think about when growing in a rooftop garden. Um, of course, you have to have enough soil to make sure that your plants can grow well. Uh, that often will mean building boxes or large containers. Of course, you then have to take into account uh, where you place them so that they're um, supported underneath. Um, having a water source in your rooftop garden is probably the most important consideration to make, just because the more difficult it is to water, um, the more likely you are not to water sufficiently through the summer, especially with reflected heat, no tree cover. Uh, those will all make your plants dry out quite quickly. Um, so if there's one piece of advice I could give, it would be really to have uh, a water system accessible. Uh, we here have all of our watering on timers so that things get watered early in the morning when you lose less to evaporation, so that way you can make the most of the water that you use. The other important thing is just choosing plants that are adapted to full sun. Of course, if you have a rooftop garden with some shade from surrounding trees or other buildings, that will affect that. But in my experience, most rooftop, most rooftop gardens really tend to, to fry in the summer. So be sure that you select plants that are adapted to those kinds of conditions and that you provide them with adequate watering and soil depth to make sure that they can stay hydrated through the summer. Okay, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges, like even in, even in designing? Like, yeah. Well, I would say just logistically, it's difficult to often get the materials to where you need it. Um, finding a way to plumb a water source up to your your garden, making sure that you know you can carry all the soil needed. We've had to do several rooftop gardens where we had to take bags and bags of soil up flights of stairs. Sometimes large containers can just be very difficult to maneuver up staircases. So making something, you know, choosing something that's modular or something that can be built um, where it's going to stay. Uh, are some things that can make it a little bit easier and prevent those issues where it just seems almost impossible to, to figure out how to get it to the rooftop itself. One notable gem is the garden on the roof of the YWCA building on Hornby Street. Not only beautiful, it grows food for single mothers and their families living in the downtown east side. My name is Kim. Um, I'm the YWCA Rooftop Garden Coordinator. 
This garden was established uh, in 2006 when it was converted from an ornamental gardens, public garden space, um, with the main uh, use behind just people coming up um, to enjoy themselves on a lunch break or to use the space um, for workshops and events for the YWCA. Um, we saw the need to, uh, for the potential of being able to um, have uh, the space be used for food growing so that we could uh, have the opportunity to feed the community and donate uh, food to the community. I'm Mae Kwan and I'm manager of YWCA Crabtree Corner Community. We're located at 533 East Hastings and in the heart of downtown Eastside. Um, we are an amazing center, I'm a little biased, um, of five floors of multi-services for single women and um, single women and their families located in the downtown east side. So it's two floors of housing, 12 units. We have a short-term emergency child care on one floor that's licensed as well as um, services for single moms and their families with a full range of programming and activities. All of that is to say we have about 800 participants who come to Crabtree um, every year and a really important aspect of what we do is we provide food security for our participants and their families. I'm here two times a week uh, to maintain the garden. Um, I have a group of volunteers that have been volunteering with me for at least five plus years. Um, they are a group of retired master gardeners um, from Van Dusen Gardens. So our knowledge uh, really complements each other. Uh, my background is food growing, their background is on the spectrum of ornamentals. Um, but we combine our knowledge together to work alongside each other to maintain the growth of the garden. Um, we grow, everything that we grow up here is edible, just so that we can maximize the space so that we can deliver um, food products to the Crabtree Corner. So we are so grateful for the opportunity that um, the YWCA Crabtree Corner Rooftop Garden produces for us. Um, we get about one ton of food every year um, from the Rooftop Garden. So Kim, our Master Garden Gardener, is does a wonderful job of planning with our um, kitchen co coordinator, our community kitchen coordinator, about what to grow for the year. And we try to match it together to, um, to the menus that we serve. We make about 100 meals a day, five days a week, and we serve it to um, the community. Um, it's typically for women and children. But because of the pandemic and we're still having to serve outside or we've been having to serve outside, we don't refuse folks who are hungry and um, are in need of a meal. Um, we do a harvest uh, once a week on Tuesdays. Um, generally it starts in June and goes all the way through to the end of October. Our last harvest, which is kind of fun, is generally kiwis. Um, that's, they're ready at the end of October, so we do a big harvest then, um, and we usually end the season off with that. Um, right now, it being uh, beginning of summer, a lot of the things that we're growing on the rooftop right now that are ready to harvest is lettuce, kale, Lots of herbs, lots of greens. Um, the raspberries have just started. The blackberries will follow. Um, I can see that there's tomatoes and cucumbers that are starting as well. So we're heading into like the peak of the season, which is really exciting. A lot of what um, is coordinated around the food that we do get from the garden is also a part of some of the kind of the new up and comings that aren't typical groceries that people would see in their stores or it's a little bit higher priced. So as an example, some of the superfoods that we, we were hearing about um, earlier on was a great opportunity to work with our gardener to see if we can grow some of the superfoods and, and introduce it to our families to see whether they, they like it or not and whether they would want to incorporate it as part of their um, as part of their meal planning and their diet. Because 
As we know, food security is a real challenge, especially more recently with the higher cost of inflation, um, becomes one of those things where people will not want to spend money to experiment on things that they don't know about and don't know whether they can feed their families with. So that's one of the really amazing opportunities that we have with the rooftop gardens to be able to experiment with different types of flavors, different types of um, superfoods that people might be curious about. One challenge about uh, rooftop gardening um, is is figuring out um, ways to manage green waste on the rooftop. Um, generally, just because the green waste that's produced here up on the rooftop, um, it uh, to, in order to like get it off the rooftop can be quite a bit of a challenge. And so we've created composting systems that have been able to facilitate the amount of green waste that we produce. Um, so we've just figured out composting um, to, which is a benefit because it'll turn into soil that we can fertilize the garden with. Um, another challenge is, uh, is sort of replenishing the soil. It's good when you're doing organic farming to be replenishing the soil. You want to feed the soil because the soil um, fertility is what produces high quality um, nutritious food. Uh, so instead of using you know chemicals and fertilizers, uh, it's good to replenish the soil with um, healthy organic topsoil. So that has been one challenge here being on the rooftop is because it's such a large space that we could you know use up to like 12 yards. We could even use like 20 yards up here and almost unlimited. So um, we've had to in the past have a dump truck come, drop it off in the alley, um, have a bunch of volunteers come, a couple wheelbarrows and one wheelbarrow at a time bring it up through the elevator onto the rooftop into the garden and back and forth and it usually takes at least a full day about 10 people to do that and we try to do that once a year back in about 2018 and 2019 um, community was actually coming to us about whether we can have more local um, plants with healing properties and so that was when we started to talk with Kim and find out how we can put that together. We we're really fortunate to have an, um, an experienced knowledge keeper around indigenous, local indigenous plants with healing properties. And so she became part of our initial team in 2019 to bring in some indigenous plants. Um, two seasons ago, we had a First Nations woman come to, and plant over 80 different native medicinal varieties of plants um, indigenous to this specific area and climate. I will, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so we've, we've, we've provided, you know, we have our food growing space, but we wanted to create a space for that also to be grown in an urban center so we could connect indigenous First Nations people back to their native medicines so they can see how it grows, they can have access to it without having to leave the city to find it out in the forest and nature. It's access right here. Um, this is one variety here. This is sweet grass that is growing. It's thriving pretty well. It's in its second year. Um, this is the yarrow. It's also a native medicinal. Um, we have Oregon grape. We have huckleberry. Um, we have Nutka Rose. So I think that that was is, uh, probably one of my favorite parts, again, of being able to connect the community with this garden space so that it's access for everybody. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I love this one. Yes! It's grown so much this year. I know. Mm. Is this sage? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just going to point out, since we're standing right here, um, this is our tomato planting zone. Um, what, one thing about uh, rooftop gardening is to increase the amount of um, plants that you're able to grow. You have to think about vertical gardening. So what, one thing that's really high value up here is space that can grow above. So having trellising equipment like this, where we can grow different types of plants to grow upwards so it doesn't have to take up ground space, then we can just increase the production. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. We need to highlight your kiwi tree. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> it's really exciting. And this over here, this is our kiwi vine. Um, it generally produces um, between two and three hundred pounds of kiwis per year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and people are always really surprised that kiwis grow in Vancouver. Me but too, they do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is an Asian pear tree. Um, generally, the pears have been um, producing just off this one main leader, the biggest one. But I just noticed this year that um, the second tree is starting to produce as well. Um, we These ones are um, a little bit smaller than the average Asian pear um, that you would find in a grocery store, but they're just as sweet and delicious. Great. Yeah. This is another um, plant that was introduced to us, and the calendula flower creates this really great um, property for <laughs> um, when we put them in oil, we are able to extract its properties to help diaper rashes. So we make this um, oil-infused sort of ointment for a lot of our moms at Crabtree to be able to use for their for their kids' bottoms, and it's a beautiful smelling flower as well so it's not yeah it's all these natural properties that that's great for the moms to be able to learn about so this zone here is our berry zone um, so we have raspberries we have thornless blackberries and then another row of raspberries and golden raspberries um, I find this is also one of um, the rooftop gardens highlights uh, generally just because um, Fresh berries can be really expensive in the grocery store, so the fact that we have such an access to such an abundance of them and that we can donate them on a weekly basis for the majority of the season is just really special. So this here are a bunch of roses that we planted, um, I think about two years ago. And so we um, harvest the, the buds once the the rose is flowered and it turns into the seed. We harvest that and it's meant to be made into teas and it's a really great source of vitamin C. And this is part of the medicinal um, plants that we've intended to, part, to grow and harvest in order to be able to share with the families. And it's because of the vitamin C content, it's great for the winter so that people can actually continue getting their vitamin C through tea. We also have a really functional greenhouse here on the rooftop as well. Um, this serves like for multi purposes throughout the season. Earlier on in February, when it's cold and raining out, I can start trays of um, seeds and seedlings in here um, where they can be protected from the elements and it's a little bit warmer in there and they can start I can start growing earlier in the season so that I have I can increase my growing um, time throughout the year um, and then in the middle of the season I have cucumbers and basil that grow in here that thrive they're just starting out right now but in about a month they'll be producing awesome yeah I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, this one flower that we grow up here on the rooftop. It's called calendula. Um, it has medicinal properties that are really cool um, and really relevant for the Crabtree Corners program. Um, what, what you're seeing here is um, we've collected them in baskets weekly, dried them down, um, and then once they're fully dry, we'll put them in a jar with a carrier oil put it in a sunny windowsill for a couple of weeks. As that, that's where the magic happens, where all of the medicinal properties get pulled out of the flower and into the oil. And then after that, it can be turned into a salve that you can put on your skin. It's good for any sort of skin issue like eczema, for diaper rash, and things like that. And it just comes from a flower. There's more to the garden than just growing food. There's also uh, a community aspect that is really, really important. The fact that we have an oasis of greenery right in the downtown core to help support the biodiversity is absolutely amazing.
we've looked at a variety of local food initiatives. And now we can answer the question we asked way back at the beginning of this series. Yes, we can raise, grow, and catch most of our food within a few miles of where we live, but it will take conscious choice and conscious effort. It may well require a change in habits and the way we see ourselves in the world. And these decisions and actions could well have a big impact on the future of our species and the whole planet.